Good evening. Welcome to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. I'm Jean McCormick, and I have the privilege of being the president of the Institute. And I'm very glad to see you join us tonight in this beautiful replica of the United States Senate chamber. Senator Kennedy had the view that if you came here and you had the chance to actually think and act like a senator, you would have a better idea of how the process works. I want to spend, uh, send a, a special thank you to, to Philip Rado and his wonderful team at WGBH for partnering with us tonight on this important conversation. Uh, WGBH seeks to enrich people's lives through programs that educate, inspire, and entertain. And we are very thrilled. We couldn't have a better collaborator for the kinds of programs we do here at the Institute because we share their mission to educate and to inspire and to teach visitors about the functioning of the role of the United States Senate in setting policy for our nation and our mission to call on people to take a more active role as citizens and to engage with their communities in meaningful ways. Since opening our doors last March, we're almost at our one year anniversary, we've strived to do just that. In the past year, we've hosted more than 10,000 students for our two hour SIM program and hundreds of thousands of people for our programs here in the chamber. Um, each month, we try to educate vi visitors about a different piece of legislation that's currently in front of the United States Senate. And we ask them to stand up in this chamber and voice their own opinions on that bill uh, and to discuss it with their fellow visitors. We've also developed an outstanding series of public programs like this one that have brought together leaders from all levels of government in our community for open conversations on how we can make meaningful progress on important issues in our nation. So it's because of our mission to engage and to educate that we're honored to be discussing tonight the future of transportation in the Commonwealth. Uh, with some of the Commonwealth's most important leaders on this issue. We're happy to welcome State Senator Thomas McGee, who is the chair of the Joint House and Senate Transportation Committee. And as Senator of the 3rd Essex District, he's been dedicated to improving the state's transportation and to having regional equality in the way we go about doing that. We're very happy to have Secretary Stephanie Pollack, who has been committed to improving the Commonwealth's infrastructure throughout her career. And as Massachusetts Secretary of Transportation under Governor Baker, she's at the forefront of the state's efforts to create a sustainable transit system. Frank DiPaolo, who is the general manager of the MBTA, has more than 30 years of experience in the design and construction industry and has been using his expertise to lead the MBTA and the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. A Better City is a nonprofit corporation that provides leadership on transportation, land development, and public infrastructure. We're really happy to have Richard Domino with us. He's been the president and CEO since 1995, so he has some thoughts on how we plan. You know, access to reliable transit options broadens the opportunity for all of Massachusetts residents to engage in our growing economy. And this evening's panelists are certainly leading the state's efforts to create innovative and sustainable infrastructure solutions that will meet the needs of future generations. But to put it another way, they're responsible for the things we love to hate when they don't go well, and that we forget to praise when they work and are there for us. Um, we need to remember that this is an important issue for the Commonwealth, and we really requires some long-range thinking. 
I want to thank all of you for being here, and especially the members of our annual Giving Society, the 1787 Society, um, for your support in what makes these free programs available. Um, I'd like to encourage you all to come back and visit when you have a minute and be a senator for a day, um, and to see our exhibits and visit Senator Kennedy's replica office. So if you will join me, I'm going to invite our panelists up. Um, welcome our moderator, Jim Browdy, for this evening's discussion. He's WGBA's Greater Boston host. And for many years, Jim has provided thoughtful commentary for his viewers and listeners on a number of important Massachusetts issues. Uh, listening to Jim and Marjorie during the week has become a favorite staple for all of us, and we're thrilled to have Jim here, and it always means it will be a lively discussion. So my friendly panelists, if you'll join us, we're happy to have you here. So uh, the format we decided to follow is one sort of modeled on what's been going on on the national level. Here's how I'm going to do this. I'll ask someone a question. They'll have a minute to respond. If they mention anybody else on the panel, <laughs> that person will have 30 seconds. Now listen. To insult the... To insult <laughs> that person's family or show a naked picture of their spouse. <laughs> and in all seriousness, the only format for this, because time really is limited, and by the way, you guys have submitted hundreds of questions that you would like asked. I'm going to try to incorporate some and then read them at the end. Brevity is the only thing I ask for because we're going to try to cover as much stuff as uh, uh, possible, if that's okay. 30 years ago, I was head to, headed, uh, hired to run a tax reform group. And on the first day that I was hired, I was taken out to the Greenfield Recorder by John Olver, who was then a state senator, then a, subsequently a congressperson. John took me to the editor of the Greenfield Recorder. His name was Tim Blagg. Apologies for my back here who said, you're never going to win anything. He said, I support your cause, but you're never going to win. And I said, why? He says, because your opponent, Barbara Anderson of Citizens for Limited Taxation, brings everything down to the barbershop level. People like you talk in billions, which means nothing to anybody at all. So with that notion in mind, we're going to start at the barbershop level. And I thought what I'd start with is something that, in the grand scheme of things, is quite small. There are a lot of questions on it. And it sort of encapsulates, to me, some of the challenges and possibilities that all of you face, namely late night tea service. Now, let me put this in con Let me put this in con Can I stand up? Let me put this in context, if I can. Uh, we just raised fares a little short of 50 million bucks, operating surplus of uh, something, yet a, whoa, yet a uh, cut in service that's going to save the system somewhere in the 9 to $10 million range. We're ridiculed in the New York Times for having done this, sort of a, a city with big dreams, but sort of small uh, uh, vision. Uh, creates difficulty for low-wage, late-night workers. On the flip side, it gives an opportunity for some of the ideas you, Secretary, have talked about, and the governor's talked about, for some sort of private sector rescue, for lack of a better expression. So based on a lot of these questions and questions we get on the radio, if we couldn't solve a problem where the numbers were that small, why should we be confident that we can solve far bigger problems with far bigger price tags? Starting with you, Secretary. Because transit systems aren't actually efficient at moving small numbers. They're efficient at moving large numbers. We are great and we will get better at moving a million people a day to where they go. But we only own one kind of bus, and it has enough seats for 40 people, and the average late night bus trip had nine. And we pay the same amount. So the truth is, we actually need different kinds of systems to meet different kinds of transit needs. And the T is kind of, you know, a hammer, and everything else is a nail. And I think that our goal is to have a great system for the million people a day, and then we can incrementally get better at doing other things, but our focus right now is on doing a good job at moving our core riders on our core system 
and late night, quite frankly, not only was it inefficient, not only was it not cost effective, not only did it not produce very many riders, it also meant that for extra hours a week, hours we desperately need, we could not put maintenance workers on the tracks to do the maintenance work that will make yeah. everybody's Monday morning commute better. Senator, is that an acceptable answer to your constituents? I, I, I think I'd like to look at it a little bit differently, and, and I think we continue to have this discussion about what this service costs and what that service costs. And I know the secretary and the general manager have both ch have challenges ahead of them, but I think we need to have a larger discussion, and we're building the trust back with the Commonwealth. What is the service that we should have, and how do we find a way to make it happen? Is late night service a part of that? Is the ride part of that? Is, is a better ferry service? And, in, in, in the region part of that, but more importantly, what do we expect the system to provide for us so that we can grow our economy and that people can have access to jobs, uh, to social life, and to make you know, a better economy here. But are so, you okay with the decision they uh, made on this? I, I would have, uh, you know, I understand why they made it, but I think the late night service uh, is something that we need to find a way to make happen. And How I think there's other services that we need to find a way to make happen. Rick, was it the right decision under the circumstances? Uh, I would have hoped, frankly, that they would have substituted the late night service, which is uh, being run with the larger buses that Stephanie talked about, with a new private model. Uh, the Senate and the, and the House uh, gave them opportunities to develop private strategies, and I would have liked to see the transition to be smoother, meaning if we're going to end the public service, let's come up with a new model, because late night service for cities and urban centers is very important. Not only are there equity issues, but also we're trying to make sure the city is sending a signal that it wants to be part of the 21st century. Frank, isn't that exactly what we have read, is that whether it's bridge or some other ride-sharing kind of thing was going to jump to the rescue here, that some of the ride-sharing services were going to reduce rates late at night, at least for a month or two, to fill in the gap? Is that what the solution is going to be here or no? Well, we hope they do. Um, we've already uh, had some contact with some of those ride-sharing companies who are willing to... Uh, fill in the gap that was left by the secession of late night service. Uh, the idea here is technology uh, for moving small groups of people efficiently has escaped the T, gone beyond us, and we think these people are set up to deliver that service much better than we could with our large network. But do, in, in light of the, the New York Times piece on this, if you haven't seen it, uh, well, I think I described it at least relatively adequately. It's sort of Boston has tried this twice, now it's shutting it down. Do you, any of you not worry that the impact on the city, is the negative impact, potentially is far greater than the thousands of riders who are going to have to find an alternative on a weekend night? Do you worry about that? So you're making a face at me, Secretary. So this is what I worry about, and, and this event is on the future of transportation, and I hope we'll get beyond the T. I worry about communities in Massachusetts where the last bus runs at 6 p.m. more than I run about communities in Massachusetts where the last bus runs at midnight or 2. I worry about communities where you can't get to church on a Sunday because we can't afford to run our regional transit administration buses. So it, it's, not, it's not that it doesn't matter. The question is, is where, you know, for me, the, the future of transportation is a conversation about priorities. And it, and it wouldn't matter if you doubled the amount of money we have. You still have to make choices, and I will defend the choice to eliminate late night service because it was not high enough of a priority given all the other transportation needs, not just of Boston and not just of the T, but of the state, which is what I am responsible for. So you're not worried for. about symbolism is what my question was. I am not worried about the symbolism. Okay, so since you mentioned priorities and money, let's get the priorities and money. We did the barbershop level, now let's do the big thing. Like, tell us briefly what the major priorities are and if you have the money to meet them, and if you don't, where are you going to find it? So our priorities are fixing, well, modernizing the system that we have, and that is as true for our highways and bridges as it is for the MBTA. We are running a transportation system on the wisdom and forethought of the people who came before us, whether that was the 19th century folks who built the, the T or the folks who built our roads and bridges. And we have basically chosen to defer maintenance and allow them to get into a state of disrepair. There's billions of dollars we need to spend. But the good news is when we rebuild them, we're not just recreating a 19th or 20th century system. That's when we step in, we modernize them, and we leave to generations yet to come the 21st century. Do we have money to do that? Uh, we are going to, the board will probably approve for public uh, comment a five-year capital investment plan that spends $14.3 billion of already identified revenue. 
are you, uh, is that uh, an accurate statement from your perspective, Senator? Money okay. there? I don't think the money's there. I, I know we're going to be spending money, but we, I still believe, and we've been talking about since 2007, about a billion dollars a year more that we have to spend in, in transportation. I totally agree with the Secretary. It needs to be a statewide. I talk about it all the time. It's not just about the T. It's about investing in statewide transportation opportunities for everyone in the Commonwealth, fairly getting the dollars we need and fairly distributing those dollars. We're talking about $540 million a year and probably a need for local roads and bridges, uh, billions of dollars on the highway. We're still working to find out what our state of good repair is on the highway. The administration's making progress on that. And we've got seven plus, 7.5 plus billion in, in state of good repair. We, we do not have the money. We, haven't, we don't have enough money. We will not have enough money to do what, in my opinion, we need to do to move this conversation forward. And that's where we need to engage uh, the, the people in the Commonwealth to, to be part of this discussion because our economy depends on it. What, what does that mean? So let's make you the czar of transportation for a minute, even though she's the czarina, sort of. Make you the czar for a minute. Tell me how we should raise money to do the things that you both it, believe need doing, but you think there isn't there's, enough there. There's a couple of pieces. I think we're making progress on it. We have to build the trust back with the public, and I think we're doing that at the T. Uh, we did a number of reforms. Can I interrupt? That. How do we build the trust back with the T when we're raising fares, which more than you thought were reasonable, at a time when they're getting pretty crappy service? Because I think we're becoming at least laying out the problems and the challenges we face. I think we have to be completely honest. I, I didn't, again, we've had this discussion. I think the fears should have been less than they were raised, uh, difference of opinion. But we have, I think we need to lay out where we're at, and I think we're making progress on that. Uh, and like I was going to say, in 09 and 13, we laid out a, a, a substantial plan to look at our assets, to, pro to select projects in a way that the public can accept, to start to lay out the real challenges we face and what the system looks like. I, I mean, I, I was, I was, uh, I would lend the other day and I was going under a bridge that I go under every day and I hadn't really noticed it. Commuter rail runs over every day, it's in terrible shape because we have not invested. We've got billions of dollars in, in state of good repair that we need to, we need to take care of. And so it, it, can I put words in your mouth? You're basically saying we have to, you have to convince the public that you're doing what needs to be done collaboratively, at which point then you go to the public and say we need to raise your taxes to fund this stuff. Well, we have to, I agree. I think last winter, we were talking about a little bit earlier, Last went to the public, and uh, the general manager and I were talking about it before we came out here. Uh, I think everybody finally figured out that whether you drove a car or on a commuter rail or you took subway or buses, when we get eight feet of snow and one or two pieces of that system break down, the whole, the whole region grinds to a halt. But has he answered my question, yes, we need new tax dollars? I think we need to find a way to add revenue, add taxes in a way that's fair, that the public will accept, but also get us the dollars we need to make a... a uh, transportation system that's good, that we can be proud of. Uh, where are you on this, Rick? Is money in the system? Absolutely. Um, Wait, there we, is enough money in the system. No, we need we need additional resources for the system. You two I, have known each other for decades, I right? I think that's why you set us on the left side of this. Uh... <laughs> you and Stephanie, I mean. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, Secretary oh, I didn't Pollock. mean said the oh, senator. You and Stephanie. Yes, uh, Secretary Pollock and I have known each other so since we... So is wrong on this uh, that she says I there's... I think what the secretary is doing together with the Baker administration regarding investing in the existing system is right on the money. I just know because... Is what? It, is right on the money. It's, uh -huh. really, it's a great decision. Uh, and actually, I feel because of their actions, there's a lot more confidence in that money being spent well and being managed wisely, which is also, like, very important. But there's just too much pressure on our transportation system for us to simply just take care of what we have. Um, you know, you just look at the urban core itself. We have 17 million square feet of development that wants to take place in South Boston. Kendall Square, another 8 million square feet of development, another 4 million square feet in North Point, and Longwood Medical wants to grow by seven. If you add up all those numbers, plus uh, we've seen TOD reports done a number, of, a number of years ago in collaboration with the secretary when, when she was a researcher, that's showing huge ridership increases, and the system isn't there. In South Boston, we want to take a huge number of trips and put them on transit when the Silver Line's at 128% capacity. So, so, can I, can so I how are we going to do that without additional money? So is the difference, Secretary, between you and Rick and the Senator that you're talking about fixing what is and making it modern. They're talking about that plus expanding to improve the economy and make people's lives better. Is that the divide on? So I think there's actually three categories of investment, and two we agree on and one we may not agree on, OK? So everyone agrees we have to fix what we have. 
And everyone is that seven billion dollars? Is that what that seven yeah, point something yeah. billion is? What, so what? How much? How much do we spend every year already on transportation capital? Three billion. You just do that for ten years. It's thirty billion. I know these sound like big numbers to people, but we are already spending mm -hmm. three billion a year in part because the legislature raised the gas tax by three cents, authorized new bonding, and we're spending those assets. So it's not. I'm not making the argument. Did we have enough money in 2000? Because we didn't. But we've added money to the Understood. system okay. multiple times. So we all agree we should fix what we have. We all agree we should modernize what we have. And I think we actually all agree that where the demand exceeds the supply, we should increase capacity. I think that there has been a history in this state where when the state wasn't growing by very much, we grew ridership on the T by adding stations, expanding it. And that was the 80s, and that was the 90s. We're in a different place. We're actually growing so fast that the easiest way, if we want more people on transit, is to take the million people who already use it every day. A 5% increase in that million people is not actually a very expensive thing to achieve. What they want is decent service, and they will come, because the development is here. A 5% increase by building new stations and new track is billions. So I don't think any of us disagree on increasing the reach of transit. I just think that we need a different strategy in a growing region than we needed when our growth was stagnant. Frank, are you worried that uh, by uh, increasing fares a significant amount, close to 10 percent, and the legislature, with all due respect to your colleagues, passing a pathetically small increase in the gas tax a couple of years ago, and then the voters repealing the indexing, that there's a disincentive for people to do what you, I assume all four of you want them to do, which is ride mass transit? Um, I don't think so. I, you, you touched on this before. It's, it's our job to show a steady improvement in performance. I think that's what will keep the people riding the service and riding the trains. And I think if people have looked over the last several months, they've been able to see a measurable improvement in our performance in not only our transit, but in our bus and our commuter rail. That service is what will attract people, not price, not discounts. Okay, I want to get back, Secretary, to your uh, financial thing. Uh, a lot of people are talking about, well, everybody is talking about the expansion of the Green Line and the debacle that was the non-budget or budget or whatever it was. Is that uh, included in your estimate of what you can afford? The uh, expansion of uh, the Michael S. Dukakis Center for something at South Station, is that included? Is South Coast Rail, which your boss said during the campaign he was going to make happen, is that uh, included? Is more than a million dollar look at North-South Rail, which a couple of former governors both like, even though your boss doesn't seem to be wild about it, what's included in your estimate of what you can afford and what isn't? Well, I think that that's the larger conversation that we will launch when we put the capital plan out. Some of those things are. In the next five years, others aren't. But again, $3 billion a year, year in and year out, we can have a conversation about how we want to spend $30 billion over the next 10 years. We can have a conversation if we want to spend more. One of the things the legislature instructed my agencies to do was to come up with a scoring system to rate projects. Not every idea that everyone has ever had is worth doing, with all due respect, including ideas I've had. Okay, And so that's why I say I think the the challenge for people in transportation is to acknowledge that while transportation is really important, it is a means to an end. And that end is prosperous communities, you know, a thriving economy for Massachusetts and giving people opportunity. But there are other investments in education, in jobs, that do the same thing. And so we have to put ours in context and we can't build everything that everyone has ever thought of just because we want to without weighing it against what other investments would, would produce in terms of a return. So does that mean that the Green Line is an iffy proposition because there may be a better way to spend the billion plus that the state would have to kick in? Well, I think the Green Line is, is going to be an interesting conversation that the board will have in May. It, it leverages a billion in federal dollars, and that is something we should not ignore. It leverages real on-the-ground development in the communities that benefit from it. But one of the things that both the T-Control Board and the DOT Board have said is, if the, if, if the value is so great, but the communities are not willing to contribute one penny to it, then why should people in other parts of the state who are still waiting for a bus to come by after 6 p.m. at night help pay for it? What do you say, to Senator, to people in other parts of the state 
who aren't going to be on that green line about why it is of value to them to support something like this? Or do you? No, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's an important piece of, of growing the economy. And, and I think that, you know, I, I go back to uh, uh, what happened recently in Assembly Square. We spent about $150 million. I think those numbers are correct in state of state and government, I mean, uh, federal government money. Parlayed about a billion and a half dollars in private investments for a station built in 27 years. So, uh, I mean, I have a little bit of a different perspective on what these dollars mean and then allowing us to have more dollars to then spread it out throughout the Commonwealth. And I think we need to find a way to invest throughout the Commonwealth so that people understand that those dollars, and, was, and, and in other parts of the state, we can, we can make substantial, uh, get a bang for our buck in a, in, for much smaller dollars in terms of regional transit investments, some of the local road investments, some of the things that we're doing in, in uh, Springfield. Uh, the Worcester uh, commuter rail station has really led to s substantial investment in Worcester. So we have to have the broader vision of what's, what's the plan for the Boston area, but more importantly, what's our plan for the, for the whole Commonwealth? And, you know, it, it, it does include making larger investments, but the, the dollars that come back are so important. And I, I joke about it. Uh, you know, Route 128 was the technology highway. Uh, and we, when that was built, we, we had substantial private investment happening there. It's, it's now becoming the technology parking lot because we didn't, what was the plan once, once the investment created what we expected to create. And that's happening in the Seaport District as well. If your argument, Senator, about the value of these investments is, is so strong, why, you know, it, when I used to be a lobbyist, and I used the term loosely at the State House, the notion was you have to give cover to legislators. You either need the leader to provide cover or you need leaders in the business community. This Transportation Finance Committee, uh, for, was it 2007, 8, whatever it is, provided cover of epic proportions for you and your colleagues. Mike Widmer, Mr. Anti-Tax at the Mass Taxpayers Foundation, that's probably not totally fair, they supported a double-digit increase in the gas tax with which we probably wouldn't be having much of this conversation, and your colleagues expended all this political capital on nothing, essentially, like a three cent increase, and now when you speak to your colleagues, they say, well, we can't raise the gas tax again, because we just raised the gas tax, even though they raised it a pitifully small amount. Why did they not understand, one, the value of this, and two, that three cents to the people at home is no different than eight cents or 10 cents, particularly when gas prices are dropping? If there was ever a time to raise the gas tax, it's when the price of gas is $2 less than it was when these discussions were being. How did they miss the boat so badly, assuming you agree they did? Well, there's two, there's two pieces to that, I think. You know, everybody understands what the local investment they need. I bet if you ask every legislator or constituents in their communities, they know what the local transportation investment re related to maybe project selection and making sure it works is important in their district. Those things don't happen. Uh, secondly, I think people take trans transportation for granted. If you polled uh, a year before we had eight feet of snow, and you said, what's one of the most important issues? Transportation polled in the, in the, in the 30% range. Nobody was talking about mm -hmm. transportation. People feel they pay their gas tax, they pay their fares, whatever they pay, they're already paying for it. The reality is we're subsidizing the whole system, and nobody understands that. So we haven't been able to, one, maintain it, or put it in a place where it needs to be over a period of, since 2007. And then, you know, then, then you're getting, you know, the, the pushback of we already pay for it, why are you raising my taxes? I mean, and that's what we're getting from our constituents. How do you get over that, that hurdle to, to recognize that we, we aren't paying for the system that we have? How do you solve that problem, Rick? I mean, how do you convince the public that, uh, that all of the things that you guys talk about in terms of the economy and making this an even more of a world-class city and state is, uh, is something that uh, uh, we've got to do and you've got to pay for it? Well, I'm glad you raised the relationship to the business community to these questions because um, the Greater Boston Chamber, uh, Jim Rooney, President and CEO, and myself just issued a uh, op-ed piece. And both of our boards have, have clearly indicated that transportation is our number one priority. And when we talk to other business associations across the state, transportation is a number one priority. And talking to any person that's looking at our economy, it's either workforce development and transportation or transportation and workforce development in terms of the top two issues that we face relative to moving the state's economy. So across the board, you're seeing more and more interest relative to transportation. And as you were saying, I mean, I was part of that effort way back when Oops, with the sorry. business community 
So no, I said, you know, Mike Widmer and I were calling for 25 cent increase in the gas tax. Uh, this is a long time ago. Uh, the gas tax is still relevant. It still will be relevant for the next 10 years. And we need to look at all forms of revenue to really begin to address the, both the structural deficiencies of our existing system and to set the stage to make our system grow to meet their economic needs. Right now, the intersection of our transportation system and our economy are not heading in the best directions. So you're right, we need to figure out a strategy to get the public in a position where they can actually be part of this conversation. I think the point that Senator McGee raised, to get, together with the efforts of the Secretary, to raise the idea of what vision, what kind of transportation future do, do we want in Massachusetts, and then second, ask the question, and how do we want to pay for it? Well, you know, the flip side of that, Director, you two gentlemen for a second, is uh, the voters elected a governor who made no secret of his intention not to raise taxes. It was not a sidebar issue, it was a central issue. And they elected Charlie Baker, saying you can, you're a manager in chief, you have some well, vision. Pardon? Rejected. The indexing of the gas the tax. The indexing of the gas tax, which is the equivalent of a 2% per year increase in the gas tax. Right, so aren't they saying, even if you don't like the message, we're okay with a no new revenue, at least no huge new revenue, was, you know, unlike fares and that sort of thing. Ha hasn't the message been sent, look at the look on your face. Oh. Hasn't the message been sent by the election of Baker and the repeal of the, uh, of the indexing? I think, uh the election of Baker was based on his competency as running, in terms of running government and running private sector activities, and we give him that. That's, there's no question about that. I think the, the challenging issue, and, and the reason why I smiled, is because you ask anybody when we're doing polls, are you interested in raising your gas tax? Come on, the answer is going to be no. But if you ask people to think about an incremental investment in their gas tax, and then tell them what they're going to get for it, and we tell them that it's going to be lockboxed and put in transportation, then we start seeing polling numbers that start moving in the right direction. Are you shaking your head? The Massachusetts Constitution already provides that the gas tax has to be spent on transportation. The I understand. The public doesn't quite understand that, though. I understand. It, it, it takes a little bit of time to actually explain that to them. Plus, honestly, uh, without some explanation about how the money is going to be used and how it relates to their economy and their quality of life and their access to jobs and services getting better, it's going to be a hard sell, and we have that job in front of us. Sure. The public doesn't understand that the money goes to the, uh, whether we, we agree with it or not. I mean, when does I was, not or does? I don't think the public believes that all those dollars come from gas tax tolls and all that, that they're, uh, they have to be allocated towards transportation. I know when the signatures were being gathered and, you know, asking questions to some of the people on the corners, and they're like, no, it goes to the general fund, it goes to these other purposes, it doesn't go to transportation. Uh, one, I don't think the public believes it. And two, to your, to your point related to Governor um, Baker, and what the public voted on. That's why we have to continue to have a larger discussion and, and, and articulate, one, that we're making progress, but two, what is the kind of system we need and how do we get there? So it doesn't mean that the public at that point when they made those decisions didn't, uh, you know, we can't anticipate we need to make different changes and have a different discussion about we where we need to go. And I think we're trying to do that. And, we're, and, I, and I've said this many times, this should be a bipartisan issue. We should find a way together to find a system, to invest in a system that's going to create a better opportunity for everyone in the Commonwealth. Well, you've I really believe that strongly. You've given him and her and him, him being the governor and his employees, essentially every single thing he asked for, haven't you? You weren't crazy in the Senate about the whatever it's called, the finance, what's that thing called? The finance? Fiscal and management. Fiscal. Thank you, whatever it is. You weren't crazy about that, you gave him that. You gave him, did you not give him a partial privatization permission thing? that you weren't crazy about, the Pacheco law. So essentially, you've given him and them all the tools that they asked for, yes? What are you getting in return? We, we, I, I want to go back to it. We've given them those tools in 09 in legislation, in 2013, yeah. in 2014, and in the control board. Uh, I, like I said, I think I, I want to give them credit. The control board, I think, has taken a serious look at it. I think the information that needs to be part of the discussion is coming out. And I think people are starting to accept that there's a much larger challenge uh, that we face. A and like I said, I think working together, we need to find a solution to building the public trust and then building a case for a larger investment in what I believe is, is, is an important piece of our, of our future. So we, we gave the administration many tools, and we're hoping that those tools are going to allow us to, to continue to get beyond the original discussion about reform. And if you look at the report last March, and, and the one piece that I thought stuck out to me was reform and revenue. It's not just about reform. We've put all the pieces in place. It was for reform before revenue in 09. We came with a small amount of revenue in 13. 
We're talking about reform again, but we need, now that we're moving forward on a lot of these reforms, we need to find a way to put more money into the system. That's what I believe. To Speaking of reform, before we get to you, Rick, and your head looks like it's going to pop off, just for you for a second, can you assure people at home that in a reason, I mean, one of the great things, I think this, what's it called? Fiscal, Fiscal management, management control. control. Thank you. You can just call it the control board. The control board has done is shine a light on a lot of things that most of us in the public didn't know about. I know from getting phone calls on the radio when people found out about these $300,000 salaries, a quarter of the T employees making more than 100 grand, their heads were ready to pop off. Are you convinced that you have the ability, now that you know what's going on, to fix those things so that people like McGee and Pollock and others can do the job they need to do to convince the public that we hear what you're saying, we're spending your money efficiently, and we're going to move forward. Are you convinced you can do it, or the yeah. contracts no, preclude, uh, no, or I'm, what? I'm confident we can do it, we can control it. The overtime will always be part of providing a public service that But not runs, 300 grand worth of... No, not to okay. 300 grand worth, but there is a inherent cost of maintaining the system and working in between the service overnight on weekends to provide those services that people desperately need and to respond during, to incidents when things break down in the system to minimize that disturbance. But you're going to bring all that, the, essentially the excesses of already, this. We have already implemented controls that will provide much closer oversight, okay. weekly reports on how much overtime is being earned by which individuals so we can control Stephanie, that. Stephanie, Secretary. It's not just, I mean, controlling costs is really important, but it's really important for people to understand why. The why is to put the money back into the parts of the system that are broken. So um, the board, when it voted the fare increase, the part that people didn't hear, in part because of protesters, was that the board created a lockbox. Every penny of the fare increase is going not into salaries. It's going into fixing the system, and it has to be fixes that will produce performance in the short term, and the board is going to is going to individually approve every expenditure of that fair money. The money that the T is saving on overtime by decreasing absenteeism, by controlling costs, which is tens of millions of dollars, all of that is going in. If we save $100 million every year, that's a half a billion dollars over the next five years, and instead of going into an unmanaged operating budget, will actually go into fixing tracks, fixing signals, buying vehicles, uh, and buying new technology. And so it's, it's not just let's fix it for the sake of fixing it. It's that we have actually been putting money into operating the system inefficiently instead of fixing it. And we're moving the money. No one's taking a penny away from the T. The legislature has been very generous with the T. Um, and we are counting on continuing to, you can't run transit without subsidy. No one would disagree with that. I wouldn't, the governor wouldn't. The question is, what are you subsidizing? And instead of subsidizing an operating budget that has not been managed, we want to subsidize capital investments, maintenance investments that make people's ride more reliable. I'm moving only to block different people. You were wanted to talk before. What were you anxious to say? Do you remember? Well, one of the things the governor did right out of the gate after the terrible conditions of the storm was to create a special panel to look at the T and the T's condition and to come up with a number of recommendations. Um, and what came out of that report and that effort was, is the T needs reform and revenue. I mean, this is the special panel report. They didn't just say reform. They said reform and revenue. The system needs both. The governor at the announcement announced that it needs reform and revenue. I'm totally... Uh, supportive and in fact I get to see firsthand the great improvements that we're making in reform in the Baker administration and, and Secretary Collins and Frank's efforts but I do know that the math just doesn't add up relative to the revenue question and I and I'm hopeful that we can actually get to that honest conversation and that the government will be part of that conversation to help us figure out the solutions you know Stephanie I think I almost got you to say on television a few months ago the following I think you actually did say it what, which was this, you'll tell me if I'm wrong, that the administration was not saying no, never to taxes, but what they were saying was that we got to deal with this reform stuff, we got to fix what is, wring whatever efficiencies out of the system, and then we can have a conversation. Not committing to raising taxes, but that's the point at which we could have a conversation. I asked the governor about that a few days later on the radio, and he said, no, that wasn't his position, but that was yours, was it not? It wasn't? Nice try. But look, again. It was, wasn't it? It was. It was not, with all due respect. 
But you tried very hard, so I will give you credit okay, for that. Thank you. Look, one of the things you did tell me in 2013 on NECN that you supported the governor's large gas tax increase, didn't you? I that part is did. true. I did. I wrote a check to the question ballot question, and the governor knew that when he hired me okay. last year. I'm not the sure point I'm is this: we lost. This, this is, I think, maybe the difference between my friend Senator McGee and my friend Rick. I looked at what happened and I said, we have not made the case. And the way we are going to make the case, and it's above my pay grade when this conversation happens, the way we're going to make the case is to run a great system, to deliver projects on time and on budget, to let people see noticeable improvements in the roads they drive on and the bridges they drive over and the MBTA vehicles they're on. And we can do that. So that is what you said. That after we can make the case, then, there then can we be can a have that discussion. Conversation. I agree. I'm not well, saying we're going to raise the gas tax. Oh, I agree with that. Have... No, no, no. That's but, what I... but just again, there's a whole state. I know this is hard to believe sitting here, but there's a whole state outside of Boston and Cambridge. So take take all the money that we take out of the gas tax to pay for the entire State Department of Transportation, which I had. Add to it all the money that we give to Chapter 90 to distribute among 351 cities and towns. Double it. That's what the T will get next year in operating support from the legislature with no increase in revenues and not counting capital support. It's not about how much money, it's about how well we spend it. My job right now, Frank's job right now, Brian Shortsleeve's job, and the control board's job, and the DOT board's job is to spend all the money we have well, and we are not even close to achieving that goal. Okay, can we talk about equity issues, at least in the estimate of a couple of people submitted questions in advance, which is also about raising money. There are two of the people here, and I can't find them, asked questions about the inequity of east-west travelers uh, paying a toll and north-south travelers, and I think they know that there's a federal issue. But putting aside the federal issue, why is that not something in terms of equity we look at recognizing not only that it's not just Boston and Cambridge, but it's not just Metro West and Western Mass, it's the North Shore and the South Shore who are getting away with murder. Hello? We can't toll federal interstates. No, but I mean, I, I, but, but can you request? Is that a reasonable thing to look at and then say to the feds, you're shaking your head yes, is of it? Yes, it is. Absolutely. So uh, why aren't we doing it? Well, I, I, it's a politically tough call, right? Because we're going to, you know, if, if an elected official asks us to look at tolls throughout the state, that uh, could be tough on the, on the ballot box. But to be honest with you, from a transportation finance and policy standpoint, that equity issue that somebody out here in the audience asked is a great question. We should be looking at open toll pricing throughout the Commonwealth. And we can certainly begin to start the conversation with the Federal Highway Administration and actually to develop special strategies and approaches that may be able to deal with some of the legal challenges. Is that, do you agree with that? that well, if you look back to what we did in 2013, we asked for the administration, the past administration, to put together, to put together a plan to look at tolling throughout the Commonwealth. And, and what it would take, including in requesting from the federal government opportunities to do it, particularly when the federal government isn't giving us the dollars we need uh, to get things done. So we, we have a 100-page report that identified areas we could do that. Uh, and a uh, little bit on the North Shore. The North Shore is impacted. My district is as impacted as anyone. The only way you get out of my district is uh, over the bridge or through the oh. tunnel. So, so it is an unfair piece. But the, the larger question is, how do we get it in a fair way? How do we do it with all electronic tolling? How do we do congestion pricing? How do we look at the region in a way that is not putting $8 tolls, but putting tolls in that are, that are fair and reasonable, and then allowing those dollars, which would be substantial, to come into a, a system that invests in all modes of transportation, and in a fair way spends those dollars around the Commonwealth. Why aren't you nodding your head in agreement when those two people are speaking, Secretary? So, you know, an interesting thing that folks seem to have forgotten is, is that Governor Patrick actually vetoed the 2013 Transportation Finance Bill, and the reason he did because it didn't resolve the issue of leaving the tolls up on the turnpike when the bonds are paid off, which happens at the end of this year. This administration, with the full support of Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito, has proposed leaving the tolls up, which the legislature booted the issue over to the executive branch, which is $130 million a year in revenue, legislatively slated to disappear in January of next year, which we are prepared to leave on the table. No credit, no one ever talks about the fact that's what we can do. The north-south tolling, I can't do about anything about right now. The east-west tolling, I can, and, and, and we have. And to be honest, that can was kicked down the road two years ago. Well, Senator. Senator. Which legislators you're talking about? There were legislators that felt that, that, that agreed with that, and we've had those discussions in terms of keeping those tolls up. And I, I advocated for, and some of us advocated for, some of those dollars going back to the communities once the 
the roads are in good shape, to start to make investments in those reasons where those tolls, particularly on the Western Turnpike, are being taken into, into account. And, and, and I think, you know, hopefully working with the administration, we can get the federal government, and I think they're starting to break down, to take a look at giving us options for other tolling. You know, the sense I get from this, uh, we have only have a few more minutes from this discussion, is you guys talk about, I mean, you obviously agree with what the Secretary and Frank are saying in terms of fixing what is so that it's in, quote, a state of good repair. I think everybody does, and that's one of the selling points. You're more expansion focused for a whole variety of reasons. It seems to me as a consumer of this, particularly when there's been such incredible cooperation between the Democrats and the legislature and the Baker administration, if you can't agree on what kind of money you need to do what you think needs doing, why are we ever going to get there? I mean, it, it, well, I, I, I you would, both I think would dis I would disagree a little with what, we, what so? you're saying, is that we, we all agree on that we need to fix what we have, and I think we have to recognize that the capacity is starting to be a real challenge. But as we make these investments, whether it be in, in the Seaport District, how are you going to get people in and out of there? There's billions of dollars continue to be invested there. What's the transportation plan that's going to allow us to continue to grow there? What's going to happen in Kendall Square? What's, where's the fairness in terms of South Coast Rail? What do we look in terms of do we, do we make access from Springfield to Boston? Again, it's a piece of our future economic growth. So it's not just about expansion. It's about having a plan that recognizes investing in what we have, maintaining what we have, but looking at a plan that's going to allow us to make investments to continue to grow the economy throughout the Commonwealth. So it is, it is a broader vision that doesn't just say we're just expansion. It's about making the system work the way it needs to work. We did the, we did the Fast 14 because one of those bridges were in trouble, and when they looked at them all, they realized those 14 bridges on 93 had to be replaced fairly quickly. You know, I, I, I'd be willing to bet there's other places in the Commonwealth that are in similar shape. Uh, you know, we can disagree on that, but that we need to take a look at the whole system. So it's not just about expansion, but it's about looking at a system that we know needs to work for us. That's fixing it, maintaining it, and making, putting expansion in place that's going to allow us to continue to grow our economy. That's where you get the equity. If you never get to Springfield, you never get to South Coast, uh, what's going to happen in those regions? Or what are the investments we need to make to allow those regions to grow? Jimmy, Secretary. Maybe what we need to all do is talk about the system that we want to have, not talk about the dollars we want to have. Probably no one in this room knows the right number of dollars to spend, and even fewer people outside of this room. I think the conversation that we hear loud and clear, and we had a series of 16 what we called capital conversations last fall, and we'll do another dozen this spring. Talk to us about what you want to invest in. We'll talk to you about what we're planning to invest in. If you think we got it wrong, Tell us, but I, I think leading the conversation with, where, with dollars as the unit of what is important is just a mistake. I don't think people are, if I may interrupt. But this, I mean, I think, we've, I think what people are doing is saying, we clearly want to do what you all are talking about, is that fix, fixing what ails the existing system, and then we want to do these other things that the senator is talking about. So here's our wish list. Here's what we believe we need for our lives to be better, for our communities to thrive and for the economy to thrive. And then you get to the question, great, that's what we have on the table. How the hell are you going to pay for it? So I don't think it's like, let's raise taxes and then see what we can do to spend the money. But it isn't the same. Except that is actually the conversation we've just been having the last 45 minutes. I just, I, that's I what it totally, sounds like. I'm just saying. I disagree. I like. disagree with that. Because the question becomes, what is the need? And I've said that for as long as I've been chair of the committee. What's the need in the Commonwealth? The dollars are here or whatever they are. The question is, what's the need? What's the need of my community? We've been, we've been waiting for the blue line since 1946. We have been blocked in because we didn't have Route, Route 95 go and, and makes access to my community. I'm not talking about raising taxes. I'm talking about what the need is. And when I talk to my colleagues, it's about what's the need for the future for our economic growth. It's not about let's raise taxes and let's put money on the table. I disagree with that. Rick. I think the point of, of looking at our needs is absolutely essential and looking at a need-based strategy that's based on a vision of our future that really relates to our economy, our quality of life, our equity, and our environment. We're uh, kind of woefully short relative to being able to capture the big picture. Um, and I what do wanna, you mean by that? Well, when we have economic growth that's not going to see mobility strategies stay, keep pace with that growth, that's a problem. When we're not looking at alternatives to revenue strategies that go beyond the gas tax, 
relative to future payment of our infrastructure, both the state of good repair and the future, that's a problem. When we're not looking at greenhouse gas reductions and mobile source pollution and coming up with innovative ways to reduce greenhouse gases because we're causing problems for the whole, whole community, that's a problem. And, we, and, and, and let's figure out what those needs are, as I think other people have been talking about here. And that's let's figure out an investment strategy to address those needs. When we're leaving people in certain sections of the metropolitan region that are transit deserts and are leaving them to have longer rides than everybody else, that's a problem. So let's, let's address the problems, let's define your needs, and then let's have an honest conversation about what we need to do to pay for it. I'm hoping we'll do that. We can't just talk about fixing what we have and not talk about these other issues and the needs that we need to address. I don't mean this disrespectfully, because I know you're a huge admirer of the I secretary. Am. Absolutely. But you're criticizing her and the administration. I'm not trying to provoke something, but you're basically saying, almost like Yvonne Abraham said in the paper yesterday, which I'm sure offended the two of you, that you, I knew it would, that they're not thinking big enough, they're not dreaming big enough. Is, I mean, you are criticizing them, are you not? Well, they're thinking hard, and I really respect the thinking that they're doing. I mean, honestly, but spending a tax dollar well and being efficient and effective is hard work. I, I was there, I was the commissioner once of a public agency, right? So spending a tax dollar well and making sure it's really well represented on behalf of all the taxpayers in this room is really a significantly challenging job. But we have to understand, again, both as policy uh, people like myself or people that are actually in the public sector, that we want to be honest about not only taking, sure, taking care of that tax dollar, but setting the stage for the next set of steps that relate to our future. And we, we, we got to walk and chew gum. We should so the answer to my question is they're not thinking big enough in your estimation. Well, uh, I, I think I'll get to you, Frank, one second. I think they're thinking really big relative to how to spend the tax dollar well. I hope that they're ready at some point to pivot and really address the future needs of the Commonwealth. We're going to wrap this in a few minutes. Frank, yes. It's, it's just that when we talk about expansion, I don't want people to lose sight. And we have an untapped capacity in both our transit, our red, orange, and blue lines. If we can get them running better, there's more capacity in just running more red line cars per hour or more orange line cars mm -hmm. per hour than most of all the expansions we've talked about combined. We can put 50, 60,000 additional seats per day on those lines by just getting the signal and power infrastructure up and running and having enough reliable vehicles to run these trains on a more frequent basis. Are you shaking your head at him or me? So I think we don't actually disagree that we need to be thinking about needs. It's just I don't define a need as a project. A project is not a need. It is one way to fulfill a need. These are the needs I have heard in the year as secretary. Communities all across the state need to fix bridges because the federal government defines anything shorter than 20 feet is not a bridge. So we can't spend federal dollars and we don't have state dollars. So we have proposed a new program specifically to pass through money to municipalities to fix broader than 20, 20 feet. Communities across the state have said, we want streets that you can walk on and bike on and get off a bus on and drive on. Those are called complete streets. There was a program when I came in that was designed to reward maybe a dozen communities that were the farthest along on complete streets. We, did, we, we redesigned the program, we put money behind the program, over 200 communities in Massachusetts have begun the process of taking advantage of that money. 200 communities in 60 days, okay? So, and there's money. There's as much money as they can apply for. There is a need to fix the signals in power on the MBTA because that is what will actually create enough trains to meet the demands. We've already ordered more orange line cars. We already have red line cars, green line cars, buses on order. Now it's signals in power. We were spending an average of $40 million a year on signals. We will, we will more than triple that. We will spend $200 million a year each of the next five years on signal power and track. So I think that what we have actually been asking ourselves are what are the needs. The difference is actually how you meet those needs. And I am more than happy to have a broader conversation. I am happy to be convinced I am wrong. The truth is, the way I thought we needed to meet those needs five or 10 years ago when I was on the outside and I didn't have all the data available to me is different than what I see now. It's one of the reasons we're trying to be so transparent. It's one of the reasons all this will be in our capital plan. It's one of the reasons that today we launched a website called MBTA Back on Track, which has every piece of data that we see on the inside about the reliability of the system. You want to find out your bus's reliability? Very exciting. It is very exciting. Because it's great. We, we do not think that we have a monopoly on being right about what the system's needs are. What we do think 
is important is to say, let's put those needs first. Let's talk in terms of needs of in, and investments. And then we can have a conversation about getting it right. OK, uh, we have, we're over time, so we're going to go down quickly. Uh, one thing, you're the, uh, each of you is going to be the czar's arena of transportation today. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to worry about what he wants. You don't have to worry about the Baker administration. You don't have to worry about either of them. And you can do whatever you want with the T. <laughs> Starting with you, you're the czar for a day of the whole transportation infrastructure. What's the single most important thing you do on day one? You don't have to get anybody's approval. You just dictate it, and it begins to move. What is it? I'd probably raise the gas tax by another 10 cents. Three people up there who don't <laughs> drive. OK. Uh, Senator Tom McGee, what would you do if you didn't have to worry about the Baker administration, the House of Representatives? You just do it. I, I can't answer the question. It's, it's a complex issue. There's so many different pieces that come into play. You can't just come in one day, and I think Secretary Pollack is kind of figuring that out as she's gone along, as well as the general manager. It's a very complex issue, and, and we're struggling to get there. Frank, you go next. I'd order a new fleet for the Green Line. <laughs> There's an honest man. And how about you could finish things up, Secretary. What would you do? I would. You don't even have to get Baker's approval. Forget the legislature. <laughs> you just do whatever you want to do on your own. What is it? I would have a serious conversation with the cities and towns and all the private businesses that keep telling me that I need to spend right. money about a more rational way of creating an investment portfolio for this commonwealth that's second to none on transportation, but not building projects, building an investment portfolio. Fair enough. Frank DiPolo, Stephanie Pollock, Tom McGee, Rick Domino, thank them all. Thank you, Rick. Good to see you. Senator, thank you for your time. Great to see you, Stephanie. Thanks. Frank, good to meet you finally. I appreciate it.